Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, as Adam mentioned, I'm going to talk about profiling and optimizing your code, and then later today we'll talk about even going further and, you know, changing the algorithm that you use and potentially using more than one processor on, on your code to speed it up. And in some cases, it can speed up rather drastically, and that's why supercomputers exist. Is there are lots of cores to use, but we'll get to that this afternoon. Uh, for now, I want to return back to what we were talking about code should be. Um, so if you recall, at least my list, but it's not all encompassing, covers the, these various things. <clears throat> and all of them are still very relevant, but now we're going to touch more on the efficiency of the code, and that's what optimization is all about. But the key thing to remember here is you can't, well, you could, but I don't think it's a good idea, focus on efficiency and ignore all of these other things. You can have really efficient code that gives you the wrong answer, and it's not worth anything. Similarly, you can have really efficient and optimized code that you can't read, and as we talked about, uh, as Eric mentioned a couple of days ago, you know, oftentimes, and this is certainly the case for me, when you're documenting your code and making it easy to read, it's so that when you come back to it in six months, uh, you're really doing yourself a favor. It's like going to bed early instead of staying out late because future you is going to be really unhappy with you for staying out late tonight. But, uh, and future you will be really happy if you, if you make your code easy to read. So, optimizing, uh, there, there's a famous quote by Don, Donald Knuth who, uh, who wrote LaTeX. Um, he's one of the, the pillars of the computer science com community. And he has this famous quote, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I think that's definitely true. One up, well, maybe not all evil, but many evils in coding. And the main reason for that is the way software and hardware interact is really complicated. And it's not easy for us, even the most advanced computer scientists, it's not easy to see when they write code how how it's going to interact with the hardware at a very, very low level. You know, languages like Python, even languages like C++ um, are pretty high level and they have a lot of functional and lower level code that sits under it. Uh, and it's unclear when you write code how what you're writing is actually going to be manipulated on, on the actual hardware and, and how you can optimize that a priori without knowing all of that business. Uh, so the point of all of this diatribe is that one should one should take the algorithm of focusing on writing good code that's correct, even if it's simple, and even if it's slow, and then work to optimize, as Adam mentioned when he was introducing. The other thing that you want to be concerned about is what are you optimizing for? There, you can optimize for, for you know, most of the time we think about just CPU speed. You just want to get this thing uh, correct and and out the door as quickly as possible. But oftentimes, that is at the expense of having an enormous footprint in your memory where you're storing a huge amount of data so that you can very quickly access that data. And that may not be, that may not be feasible with the computing system that you have. Or, uh, so for, for, as an example of this, there are a number of supercomputing clusters around the country that are operated by the National Science Foundation or NASA or the Department of Energy, uh, and you can apply. Uh, well, I guess a question for the audience. Have people run simulations on any national clusters? Yeah. OK, awesome. I'll also interject. We're going to learn a lot more about that tomorrow as well. Right. OK. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, as an example of this, there are systems like, uh, there's a system called Pleiades. Uh, that's run by NASA that that doesn't have the fastest processors, but it has a lot of memory. Whereas then there are systems like Stampede, that's a, an Exceed, a National Science Foundation Exceed uh, system that's kind of lacking in, in uh, memory, but it has a lot of processing speed. So, so you have to, at some level, cater your code to the, the system on which you're going to be running. 
Um, input output, if, there, if you're doing a lot of transfers from hard drive space to in memory or even across the network, uh, maybe you're, I mean, we don't do as much of that, but maybe with LSST, it certainly will be the case that there's a lot of uh, data transfer over the network. You need to optimize for that because you don't have an unlimited bandwidth to, to access all of these data. And finally, even storage space. Uh, so that's where the caching and that sort of thing, while it's valuable, uh, can, can kind of bite you um, down the road if you're not careful about it. Okay, so there are a number of profiling utilities. And when I say profiling, this is the step where you identify where there are bottlenecks in your code. Um, we're gonna talk primarily about speed because that's usually what people are, are profiling and trying to optimize on. But uh, there are some utilities for, uh, for profiling for memory consumption on the computer as well. So this is kind of going from most basic to most advanced, really. Um, there's kind of a description for each, and we're gonna, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do some, some more fraught live coding that, uh, to try and demonstrate some of these, these tools. Um, many of you are probably familiar with time. Well, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with time, but the, 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 the code time, which is essentially, it's very basic. If you just say time before any command on a, on a command line prompt, uh, it will run the normal actions that you set after the time command. So time python script.py. And it'll run forward just as it would if you ran python script.py. And at the very end, it'll give you a few numbers giving you just basic information about how much time it took on the processor, how much time it took in real time, so on and so forth. So it's a very base level thing, but it's, it's actually pretty convenient and pretty useful. I use it quite a lot. Um, time it is a a tool that is actually used best in the environment like uh, notebooks, like Jupyter Notebooks, for doing very quick little tests on, you know, it could be a one-liner. You want to see how quickly something runs, and it will, <clears throat> if it's fast enough, it will repeat that for some, you know, 10,000, 100,000 times and kind of give you the average over which that, that uh, piece of code that you've given it actually takes to run. So it's very good for comparing two separate methods for getting the same result because one might be dramatically longer than the other. And this is, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a bit more into this. And this is certainly in the, the uh, workbook that you guys will be doing later. C profile is kind of the deepest level. Um, it's a module that you can load when you run Python. So you can do like Python-M C profile and then your code. And it, it spits out a bunch of additional information from the code based on each function that it goes through and each sub, sub function and, and class and method that it touches. It keeps track of how long it spends in each of those at a very, very deep level. Whereas time is just kind of the bulk information and time it is just for code snippets. C profile does this for the entire code. Um, there are it, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of overhead associated with it, not substantial for the kind of codes that we're going to be dealing with today, but if you have a really, really large piece of code that's usually very time consuming, this will make it more time consuming. So it might not be feasible, in which case you might want to use, and we'll, I'll just mention it, but we're not going to actually be doing any of this. There are statistical profilers that essentially run and check every you know, 100 nanoseconds, what's the state of the code? Who's been running? Who's been running? So it's a, a statistical approach. It's like a Monte Carlo method for figuring out which processes and which functions are being used the most, which is sometimes, it's, it's less overhead, so it's, it's less onerous for systems or for programs that you're running that are uh, really, you know, time consuming. So C profile we're gonna deal with, and then there are a variety of different uh, tools that you can use. There's a lot of snake tools, which I really like. Um, PStats is very kind of vanilla and, and text-based. We're, we're not gonna do so much with that because I don't think it's quite very interesting. Uh, SnakeViz is great. Run Snake Run, I couldn't get to run on this computer with Python 3, so we won't be dealing with that, but that's a nice pipeline for showing, or a pipeline for showing uh, this function goes to this function, which goes to this function, which also touches on this class. So it's very good for kind of mapping and understanding what the flow of your, your code is in general, but also it gives you <clears throat> larger boxes for uh, larger 
uh, more time consuming methods and that sort of thing. And then finally, there's this uh, pi profile to HTML. There are a few different pi profile ones. I, I just tend to like this one that convert the outputs of C profile to a, a nice HTML visualization that you can kind of interact with locally and it's much easier to deal with than pstats. <clears throat> then finally, uh, these are very similar in terms of how they're written and how you interact with them. Line profiler and memory profiler. Line profiler allows you to get line by line uh, in a function, not in an, in an entire code, but in a function, what the time consumption is for line by line. So you can really get deep in there and find where hotspots are. And memory profiler, profiler does the same thing, line by line in a function, but it, it gives you the amount of memory that's being consumed by individual lines. And you can put it at different points to see uh, has there been a substantial change in the amount of memory from this point to this point. So let's actually do these things instead of just talking about it. Is that still visible? Maybe that's better. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's start out by <clears throat> doing some. Oh, no, I actually had a notebook. This is not a notebook, but this is. Okay, so we'll do a bit of both. Because the, the problem with many of these tools is that they function better in a notebook environment or they function better at a command line environment. So when you're running C profile, it's usually best to do that because you're dealing with an entire program. You usually want to do it at the command line. Whereas when you're, um, when you're using time it or something like that, it's usually best to be in, the, in a notebook or an IPython instance. So I'm just going to run these. Clear the... All right. So, as I said, time is uh, is just very coarse level, and it's the equivalent of saying time, and then you run your Python instance or whatever. Or it doesn't. It's not restricted to Python. It's for anything, really, any command line uh, operation. So, Sorry, yeah. can I pause you? Absolutely. Pause you so uh, I'll just ask a question. Does anyone have? Uh, any idea why what Cameron is about to do is not a good idea. It's going to frame program? Was that? It's going to frame program? Uh, no. Or maybe, but that's not what I'm thinking. So, so we care. Sorry, yeah. Uh, isn't there a thing where um, Python gets faster? Um, which it stops doing all the internal checking to the other ones. So, like, if you call a function multiple times, it stops, uh, the interpreter stops checking each individual one. Uh, I think that may be a thing, but that's not what I'm thinking. All right, I'll just I'll say what I'm thinking since <laughs> this is clearly not clear. So, so immediately we can tell that Cameron's got about eight tabs open, which means his browser is doing a lot of stuff on his CPU in the background. He's probably got. I'm not saying you should close everything. Yeah. But <laughs> he's probably if he you know minimized that screen and has a whole bunch of things. Especially right, we shouldn't be clicking over to read our email as we're coding. Or I'm running the thing, so now I'm going to go check Twitter. Right, when you're profiling, if you truly want to profile, the only thing you should be doing is running your. Code. There should be nothing else happening on your system. Otherwise, you're not getting a true, a true estimate of, of how fast uh, the code is. Sorry. No, that's fair. And at the very least, if you do have a bunch of stuff, don't be clicking back and forth. So that's what I, that, that's my like, my in between is usually I, I'll, I'll hit enter and then I'll stare at it and wait for it to complete and do that for both instances or three instances if I'm comparing things as opposed to clicking around and doing other operations. But yes, there are background things that are both taking up memory as well as doing things in the back. So you're absolutely right. And you guys are familiar with the the, uh, the double percent sign for these magic numbers? Is everyone? Is anyone? Okay. So. Uh, so all we're doing here is we're just going to time how long it takes to complete this uh, this 4x in range 
you know, a million, and then and and square it to get a list out of this with the first million squares. So you run it, and it takes a second, and it tells us three numbers: user, <coughs> sys, and total. Total is the actual wall clock. That's the actual time that we needed. It was 3.91 seconds. System is the amount of time that it takes inside kernel processes uh, that the computer's actually using or like spending on this. And then user is the amount of time uh, that that is outside of kernel processes. But that also includes blocking for I.O. So if you have some sort of thing where it's waiting for me to click enter or something like that, uh, user can be very large, and it's not necessarily indicative that uh, the code is, is bad or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so, did you say total was the actual wall time? Oh, here's the wall time. Total, uh, user, is, user is blocking, hmm. Go by, go by the wall time since that's what we're talking. Usually you don't see this. Usually at the command line, if you run it, it just shows the three. But um, usually total is is a good analog. Uh, so then we're just going to test this uh, with the NumPy range uh, enumerator here to see if it in fact gives you similar values. And the total time spent is slightly different. Um, maybe, as Adam points out, that's due to background processes because it's in the relatively small numbers. But we're about to find out more information about that. Uh, oh, and furthermore, so this is essentially giving you the first million squares. And so it does so using the Python native range, NumPy A range, and, but this is really unnecessary to do 4i in that and then x squared. We could just take the range and square it because that's one of the benefits of using NumPy arrays is you can do these inline processes. So we'll just see what kind of time that takes to run. And it's dramatically faster. Going from 4 seconds to 80 milliseconds. Uh, so that's kind of the first rule about optimization is if there are built-in functions for Python or particularly for NumPy, use them. Don't reinvent the wheel because you're probably not going to be as efficient as the cadre of coders that are working on these packages uh, who have optimization in mind. Sometimes, oftentimes there won't be built-ins that work for your particular use case or task and you'll have to do your own, but if if a quick search on the internet reveals that there is a built-in for, for doing the kind of operation that you're doing, just use it. It's, it's going to be good. Thanks. All right, so time it. Have people seen time it before? Have people used time it before? So this is all review and I shouldn't be talking about it. I'll talk about it a little, a little bit. Um, so time it, as, we, as I said, uh, runs things multiple times. In this case, all we're going to do <clears throat> is construct a new list from an old list of strings and basically append to the new list for each of the, the, the words or each of the strings in that particular list. So we all expect this not to be grand, but we'll find out. So it says two microseconds per loop, and it ran it a bunch of times. Now, what if we, we um, more appropriately try and use some sort of list comprehension on this, which should be faster because it's pushing what would normally be, when we do these append statements, essentially what's happening is it's, it's building a new list each time it appends and it can be really, really time consuming and oftentimes um, you, you don't want that. So what happens when we use list comprehension? Run. It seems like it's taking longer, but it's running a lot of loops. So it's a bit faster, 1.8 microseconds. Um, and finally, uh, this is heralding back to stuff that you guys covered yesterday with Yusra, um, the map function. So this is not necessarily part of the map reduce, but it's effectively the same thing. If you have a function that you can effectively apply to an entire list of objects, uh, in this case, these strings, 
uh, things are going to be things are going to be better for you. So we dropped from 1.79 microseconds to 362 nanoseconds. So a substantial drop uh, in overall time consumed. And it sometimes gives you these these messages about the variance and how how long it takes to complete these things. But so. Yes. Sorry, I'll just add a quick note. I just realized yesterday that the time, the results of time it are different between 3.5 and 3.6. Oh, really? And in 3.6, what you actually get is the mean plus or minus the standard deviation. Ah, okay. Uh, so if people have have both on their machines, you may find it more useful for the exercise to use 3.6. And if you don't, that's fine. You can you, you'll get an answer either way. That's right. Okay. Okay, that's, that's good to know. I didn't realize that. But okay, so lesson two uh, for kind of optimizing, aside from using built-ins, the map function is very effective. And it's going to be more effective when we get to parallelization later today. Um, lambda functions, these one-off functions that, uh, that can operate kind of quickly. Uh, let's just see. Let's see if a uh, lambda function is in any uh, capacity faster, in this case, than like a named function for doing two times uh, whatever uh, int you give it. In this case, no, because, I mean, it's not expected to be uh, in this case. But uh, let's get to some interesting cases. More of this comprehension is kind of boring. Oh, yeah, these are good. Let's switch. OK, so we've, we've talked about time and time it. Um, let's do something with C profile. So let's make, uh, let's make uh, as, as I was showing here, ah, that's the wrong. Um, so let's make a bunch of functions that we artificially slow down. That's essentially what we're doing here. We import time. Uh, we, we have a fast function, a, a, a slow function, and a medium function, where each one of these takes some arbitrarily long amount of time because we just activate the sleep function. So when we run this, I mean, this is uh, pretty boring, but it's illustrative. OK, so we can run this. And as you might expect, fast goes quickly, slow waits three seconds, and then a little slowly waits half a second. OK, so uh, let's actually do some profiling on this. So as I said, when you run C profile, which is kind of the deeper level profiling, you do python-m C profile, and then you specify an output file. You don't have to, because it'll just print it to the screen, but it's not particularly useful when you do that. So usually what I do, uh, as my output file is rather than doing test.py, which is the name of the program, I do test.prof for profile, and then the name of the script that we're running, test.py. So it runs, but it's keeping track of all the business at the same time, and it produced a test.prof file. Now, as I said, there are a number of ways that you can interact with that. Uh, one of the most basic ones is pi prof to html and then the name of the profile file. So when we do that, it creates an html directory and we can just go in there and there's an index.html and boom, it brings up this nice website where it lists all of the individual functions that are being called. Uh, so in this case, test.py1 is, is kind of the, the, uh, the first line in the code. And then you have the other functions, slow, medium, and fast. And then it has sleep, which is, you know, it, obviously this is a simple function, but, but uh, it tries to color code it by the amount of time it's taking so that you can see hot loops. You can see areas where you're wasting time. Or maybe not wasting time, where you're spending a lot of time. Maybe that time is well warranted in those particular locations. But maybe there are, there's room in those locations to optimize things. 
So the whole point of this is to identify these areas that are bottlenecked. There may be bad code in, in test.py for fast. There may be but it's not making a difference for our overall optimization. So that's, that's why you don't want to prematurely optimize is because you might be optimizing something that really doesn't matter at all. And ultimately, person time is much more important than computer time. Uh, yes, computers are fast. So if you, if you go out of your way and you design this awesome algorithm and you spend a day doing it and then it saves you like 10 minutes of computing time, well, we all make mistakes. <laughs> and I've certainly done that. So uh, so once we've done this and we realize that, uh, well, first of all, there are a few different headers here. I'm sure you can make sense of them. End calls, the number of times something, a particular function is called. Total time is uh, obviously the total time that's actually spent in that process, whereas cumulative time is the time spent in that process and any sub calls. So you see that test.py uh, line one, which is the start of the program, has the exact has a little bit more cumulative time than sleep does because it called all these functions that called sleep. That's the first line of your program is always going to be the most time or cumulative time because because it's the first line of your program and it contains all the rest of the lines after it. So the ones that you really are worried about are if you have way too many calls to something and you can oh. Oh, I forgot, I left an extra for loop in there that I don't necessarily need. And that's why I have 100 billion calls to a particular function that I don't necessarily need. Or look, looking at um, total time or per call to, to try and actually go into that function and identify where the, the slow parts are. So that's, that's what we're going to do next is now that we know that, uh, well, we can't really go into the time. In our code, the next slowest line is this slow function, unsurprisingly. So what we want to do is go back to the code, and this is an iterative process to identify parts. We're going to add in a little line that says at profile. It's a little decorator here. And now I'm not going to run C profile, I'm going to run line profile, which is activated by saying kern prof dash L, dash V, uh, and then the name of the file that we're running, which is test.py. So if I run that, again, it runs through the entire program, but it spits out this info, uh, this doesn't look so good. I'm going to close this side so we can actually see what the heck is going on. Uh, essentially what it gives us is a line by line uh, accounting of the time that's taken in that particular function. So, of course, this is a very simple function, but it goes through line by line, and then it shows us, oh, holy cow, 100% of the time in this function is on that sleep, uh, sleep call. Again, unsurprisingly, this is a very simple case, but we can go and see, oh, we need to be messing around with that. That's what we need to be changing. Uh, in order to alleviate the, the slowness in our particular program. It's not this, we shouldn't waste our optimization on this principle. Um, similarly, we can look at the, the memory consumption by doing python-m <coughs> memory profiler, and then the same thing, test.py. Uh, and it runs it forward, and it's still keyed in with that decorator profile that's sitting on the, on the slow function. And now it tells us, oh, you're using 27 megabytes of memory at this part of the code. Then you go to this, this part and the next line, and you're using the same amount. So we don't have any kind of memory bottlenecks. It's just a, a computing time bottleneck that we're encountering there. But this is useful um, for more memory intensive applications. So other ways in which that we can, uh, well, here, let's have a less boring version. Um, I have a code that I was going to include in your work, your, your notebooks today, but I couldn't, I couldn't get it all the way working to generate a million spectra and then have you guys analyze them, because they'd be pretty sweet. But um, 
but it's a code and it, you guys don't have to understand the, 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 the basics of it to be able to profile it. And so let's do that same process that we just did. Um, oh yeah, and there's one more thing. I didn't show you SnakeViz, which is really cool. So SnakeViz is this super cool program that we, we, uh, we run in the same way we did pi prof to HTML just by invoking SnakeViz and then uh, the profile output. And you run it and it opens up in a web browser and it makes, you can either do this Sunbur style, I actually prefer Icicle because it gives you information about the top level and then the, the, the more, the most uh, time consuming of each in layer below it. And so if I click on this, as you can see on the left side, it's saying, oh, it took three and a half seconds to run cumulative time, because again, that was the first line of the code. But it also shows us, okay, so we, we skip down here, that's the, the main function. And then we get, oh, wow, all of our time's being spent in slow here. And then all of that time is actually being spent in sleep. So I can click on that and it gives me like better context of what's going on. Um, I can click on it and it gives me the full call stack of like how to get there, which is pretty useful in more sophisticated codes that we'd be, that we'd be looking at. Um, if one's not labeled, it's just because the text couldn't show up there, so medium isn't really taking up any time. And in fact, uh, because we have a cutoff applied here, okay, let's not cut off, uh, that's too small to even see. We can't see uh, fast, the fast function, because it's just not taking up any time at all relative to our sleep. So this is a really useful way. Again, the algorithm that I propose you follow, and this is certainly what I've written into the notebook that you guys will be doing, is to run your, to you know, write your code as you would, profile it uh, from time to time with time it if you are, have to make a quick decision about if you want to use a particular way of uh, creating an array or, or a list. Um, but, but for the most part, just write it in the best way that's most easy to read. And then once you've got it working, and once you've got testing at some level working, because you want to make sure that this continues to be correct in its, in its functionality, uh, you run C profile, generate something like this to identify any kind of bottlenecks. If you find a bottleneck in a particular function that seems to be slowing things down, drop out of this, put that little app profile uh, decorator before that particular function, run the line profiler, look at line by line in it, and then go into the code and see, oh, oh, that particular line I can, I can change, I can make it better, or it actually needs to stay as it is. And, and, and so you do this recursive process until you get things as optimized as you really want. And a key, a key point this is, that's along the lines of human time is more, important in computing time is you don't have to optimize this up the wazoo. You just have to do it as well as you need it to run. So uh, don't unnecessarily optimize if, if it's good enough. Okay, so as I said, there's another piece of code that we can test on. Um, oops. Sorry, can I? Yes. I missed it. How did you get the test that prop? I generated it just as I'm doing now. So you um, run Python. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is kind of, can everyone see this? Is it too low? Shall I? I don't even know how to make it up. But can people see the bottom line where I'm doing stuff here? I'll can you create a window below that? Yeah. Dash uh, M, C, profile, and then in this case, I'm just going to, oh, actually, yeah, I have to give it an output. It's vector.prof, and then vector.py. So I'm just going to run this spectra.py code and generate a spectra.prof profile uh, output using the C profile. So I run it, and it runs, and now, oh, yeah, it had some outputs associated with it, too. Not 100 billion spectra in this case. Um, so now we have this spectra dot prof, and that is the thing that we can then analyze. So in this case, let's let's use old uh, snake viz again, and it 
takes a bit longer because it's more, there's more going on. Again, I'm going to switch to this icicle mode. So again, the first line is, is taking the most time, cumulative, uh, and we step in. So spectra.py, I'm going to click on that so I have a better view of what's going on here. This is the plot function. That's the thing in the parentheses. So that's, that seems to be the thing, if I click reset to go back here, it's taking up the lion's share of the time. And in fact, it says down here, it's taking up 78% of the runtime just in this plot function, uh, which is actually okay by me because I'm just using matplotlib's pyplot and I can't speed that up. And I need to output these files. So the, I, I'm reasonably happy with the fact that the time consumption is is on code that I'm not in control of. There are ways in some cases to speed that sort of thing up by uh, packaging things more effectively in terms of how you get the data to a visual interface. But for this particular instance, <coughs> it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. So we can look, yeah, see these are all just, all just pyplot commands. So I'm reasonably happy about that. Are there any things here that are due to me. So just looking here, pyplot.py, yeah, these aren't these aren't mine. This is numpy's, uh, matplotlib. Ah, here's mine, spectra.py, taking up a whopping 0.48% of the, of the total con uh, time consumption. Okay, so that makes me feel a little bit better um, that, I'm, that I'm not uh, writing super bad code. Anyway, if there were something that I could actually then do line profile on or memory profile, then it might be useful to, to, to do that. But for 0.5% of the overall time, it's just not worth, worth the effort. Okay, so so concepts in general to remember. Decide what you want to optimize over. Computer time isn't as important as your time. Remember, astronomers are people too. Write readable code first and then optimize, then use your profilers to identify the bottlenecks in your code, address those bottlenecks one at a time, and, and, and this is an iterative process where you gradually get rid of these bottlenecks until, uh, until you have it as optimized as you want. Um, just kind of general hints, the latest version of most codes is the most optimized, so using Python 3.6 or whatever is probably going to be better than 2.7. Uh, trying new approaches in your, in your coding and, and testing that, using, using either test it for small things or using the profiling can get past some of these hurdles that, that maybe you've, you've gotten into in, in coding in a, in a particular fashion. Object-oriented code is going to help with this. Um, remember using specific tools for specific tasks, which we covered and you guys will deal with in the notebooks. And then finally, a, a few other concepts. NumPy arrays are very, very well optimized for many, many tasks, even beyond uh, native Python lists at some level. Try to vectorize loops whenever possible. Uh, get rid of for loops. If, if you can, oftentimes you can do this with, a, with careful use of masks on your, on your lists of objects or on NumPy arrays. Um, use list comprehensions for creating arrays or lists because they tend to be more efficient than you know, just running a, a for loop. <clears throat> Try not to use appends in, in, uh, in large amounts because they, they're rather slow and memory consuming. And yeah, these are just some general things. I, I, I'm just going to mention there are some additional things that you can do to optimize your code. Cython is a Pythonic language that essentially compiles down to C code, which is extremely fast. And there are only a few additional steps that you need to write in your Python code. It has its own problems, but it can be extremely fast. Have, have people here used Cython at all? Yeah. Has it been a good experience? Yeah. So, uh, Cython is good. Numba is a is a code that I don't have any experience, or perhaps you guys have experience with. Does anybody? Yeah, I've used it. And it's just 
remarkably easy. You just detect a rate on every function, and it's and it just goes. In some cases, was a little bit faster than Python. If the function is small enough, mm -hmm. and, okay. And then finally, algorithm design and parallelization can help dramatically, and that's something that uh, that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So, uh, I believe Eric wanted to talk about some. Sorry, right. happy thing. Before we do that, yes. uh, let's thank Cameron. Oh. And to ask if there are any questions. Much of this, in case you didn't take a lot of notes, much of this is written explicitly in the notebook that you guys will be dealing with. How to install these various different programs before you're asked to do something with them and that sort of thing. So, yes. How do you know this concept, like from your own experience or from Partially my own experience, partially, uh, you know, forums where you, you go and you, you uh, encounter people who've gone through this sort of thing in the past. It's just being, being in the field long enough, you just run into a lot of these. And it, it's hard to forget when you lose a day or two of your work because you did something the wrong way. So. So making mistakes. Yes, it's making mistakes. The best way to learn. It is the best way to learn. I have a quick question as yes. well. So you said avoid appends. Uh, there is both. There is a, there's a appending for lists, which is what I think you were saying to avoid. But NumPy also has an append method. That's right. It does. Should it's that like be avoided? Happen. No, I that's okay. That's generally okay, okay as long as you're not using it to construct long NumPy arrays in that fashion, uh, because it it. Even with NumPy, when you use append, it's, it's essentially taking two, it, it's building a new array in, as opposed to adding it on. And so it's going to be time consuming and memory consuming if you do this to build like a large array. Whereas there are much more effective means for, for doing that with list comprehension and then, uh, or just assigning it, like creating an empty array that's a million items long and then filling it in one at a time so that you're not just, oh, I need another byte so it has to grab another chunk of memory to, to do that. And I need another byte so it has to grab another chunk of memory. So yeah, in general, append is fine when you're dealing with it in small amounts, but you don't want to construct large structures using just append or concatenate. So kind of along that vein, just in place operations and like Having these dummy arrays? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oftentimes, constructing an array with MP empty or MP zero, something like uh, NumPy zeros uh, or ones or something like that, and then filling in along the way can be much, much more efficient than, than constructing with a pen or, or even generating a list and then turning it into a NumPy array. I, I prefer to set up the memory already and then just fill it in. I think one piece of suggestion that I have is that often, you know, you should only worry about that when you've got like at least a million, right. it's sort of the very rough ballpark. Do whatever makes sense to your brain up until you get to that point, Yeah. which is going to be different for different people. Like, I actually like append. I think that's more natural to use than the fill-in that, that right. uh, Cameron is talking about. But I when I get to a million, all of a sudden I think, oh, wait, got to use the empty trick because now it's going to take it's forever. Be, yeah. But yeah, if you're dealing with small numbers, like yeah. again, ease of of readability and and style at that level is more important than optimization and efficiency when it's small numbers. Yes, sir. I was I was actually gonna just say just that you were you made the good point earlier that human time is often more important than computer time. But um, taking that further, you can save future humans' time looking at your code by uh, balancing readability and speed. Future you time. Future you, yeah. yeah. That's, that's how you really keep with it. It's like, oh, this is for me. It's not just for some anonymous audience. OK, cool. Well, that was a perfect oh, transition. Do you have a question? I can ask later. Okay. You should ask now. All right. Um, so you, you mentioned that the object-oriented approach is uh, really fast. Also. It tends to be much more efficient because you're not wasting code. I mean, there are ways of slowing it down with some of the, the concept concepts we've talked about, but in general, 
uh, passing objects between struct or objects that are you know, classes between different operations is oftentimes faster than than other methods if you were to do a procedural method. And does that still hold if you have like a ton of objects, like say in your uh, Galaxy example? If oh yeah. Add it in. Yeah, you guys will. You guys will. That's your challenge question. Oh, cool. Is you know throw. I guess I didn't explicitly say increase the number of galaxies to use, but that's certainly an option. Um, and see how it handles it, and see how the memory profiler looks, and see how speed looks. But yeah, absolutely, that's that's the way, that's the best way to do it. With the simulations that we run, absolutely, you want to use object-oriented code. It, it's the best thing to scale for that. And organizationally, it's just easier bookkeeping. Yeah, and just one thing to add to that. that. So I think what you might be touching on is that in Python, if you have a million objects, often that is a lot slower than if you weren't to be weren't using object-oriented programming because you have to initialize each of those million objects. Mm -hmm. But I think what Karen's pointing out is that the uh, using object-oriented programming, you can sometimes get away with having just one object that represents a million things mm -hmm. much more easily than you could without using object-oriented programming. And that is super efficient. That's the magic of NumPy, basically. Any other questions? Yeah? Are we going to 